Section Zero of the Natural History of Chocolate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. De Quellis. Preface If the merit of a natural history depends upon the truth of the facts which are brought to support it, then an unprejudiced eyewitness is more proper to write it than any other person, and I dare even flatter myself that this will not be disagreeable to the public, notwithstanding its resemblance to the particular treatises of Colmenero, one, de four, two, and several others who have wrote upon the same subject. Upon examination, so great a difference will appear that no one can justly accuse me of having borrowed anything from these writers. This small treatise is nothing but the substance and result of the observations that I made in the American islands during the fifteen years which I was obliged to stay there, upon the account of His Majesty's service. The great trade they drive there in chocolate excited my curiosity to examine more strictly than ordinary into its origin, culture, properties, and uses. I was not a little surprised when I every day discovered, as to the nature of the plant and the customs of the country, a great number of facts contrary to the ideas and prejudices for which the writers on this subject have given room. For this reason, I resolved to examine everything myself and to represent nothing but as it really was in nature, to advance nothing but what I had experienced and even to doubt of the experiments themselves, till I had repeated them with the utmost exactness. Without these precautions, there can be no great dependence on the greatest part of the facts, which are produced by those who write upon any historical matter from memorandums, which, from the nature of the subject, they cannot fully comprehend. As for my reasonings upon the nature, virtues, and uses of chocolate, Perhaps they may be suspected by some people, because they relate to an art which I do not profess, but let that be as it will, the facts upon which they are founded are certain, and everyone is at liberty to make what other inferences they like best. As there are several names of plants and terms of art used in those countries, which I have been obliged to make use of, and which it was necessary to explain somewhat at large, that they might be rightly understood. Rather than make frequent digressions and interrupt the discourse, I have thought fit to number these terms and to explain them at the end of this treatise. The reader must therefore look forward for those remarks under their particular numbers. 1. De Chocolata India 2. De Thé, De Café and De Chocolat End of section zero. Section one of the Natural History of Chocolate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Landu. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. De Coelus. The First Part, Chapter One. Chapter One. The description of the cacao tree. The cacao tree is moderately tall and thick, and either thrives or not, according to the quality of the soil wherein it grows. Upon the coast of Caraqua, for instance, it grows considerably larger than in the islands belonging to the French. Its wood is porous and very light, the bark is pretty firm, and of the colour of cinnamon, more or less dark, according to the age of the tree. The leaves are about nine inches long and fall in breadth, where they are broadest, for they grow less towards the two extremities, where they terminate in a point. Their colour is a little darkish, but more bright above than underneath. They are joined to stalks three inches long, and the tenth part of an inch broad. This stalk, as it enters the leaf, makes a straight rib, a little raised along the middle, which grows proportionably less the nearer it comes to the end. From each side of this rib proceed thirteen or fourteen crooked threads, alternately. As these leaves only fall off successively, 
and in proportion as others grow again. This tree never appears naked, it is always flourishing, but more specially so towards the two solstices than in the other seasons. The blossoms, which are regular and like a rose, but very small and without smell, proceed from the places from which the old leaves fall, as it were in bunches. A large quantity of these fall off, for hardly ten of a thousand come to good, insomuch that the earth underneath seems covered over with them. Every blossom is joined to the tree by a slender stalk half an inch or a little more in length, when it is yet in the bud. It is one-fifth of an inch broad, and about one-fourth or a little more in length. When it was least in proportion to the tree and the fruit, the more strange it appeared to me, and more worthy of attention. When the buds begin to blow, one may consider the calyx, the foliage, and the heart of the blossom. The calyx is formed of the cover of the bud, divided into five parts, or leaves, of a very pale flesh colour. These are succeeded by the five true leaves of the same colour, which fill up the empty spaces or partitions of the calyx. These leaves have two parts, the undermost of which is like an oblong cup, striped with purple on the inside. It bends towards the centre by the help of a stamen, which serves to fasten it. From this proceeds outwardly the other part of the leaf, which seems to be separate from it, and is formed like the end of a pike. The heart is composed of five threads and five stamina, with the pistilla in the middle. The threads are straight and of a purple colour, and placed over against the intervals of the leaves. The stamina are white, and bend outwardly with a kind of a button on the top, which insinuates itself into the middle of each leaf to sustain itself. When one looks at these small objects through a microscope, one is ready to say that the point of the threads is like silver, and that the stamina are crystal, as well as the pistilla, which nature seems to have placed in the centre, either to be the primacy of the young fruit, or to serve to defend it. If it to be true that this embryo unfolds itself, and it's produced in no other place but the base. For want of observing these small parts, as well as the bulk of the blossom, F. Plumier had no distinct knowledge of them, nor has he exactly designed them, any more than Mons Turnfort, who has done them after his draft. The cacao tree almost all the year bears fruit of all ages, which ripen successively, but never grow on the end of little branches, as our fruits in Europe do, but along the trunk and the chief boughs, which is not rare in these countries, where several trees do the like, such as the cocoyeurs, the apricots of St. Domingo, the kale bashes, the pawpaws, and etc. Such an unusual appearance would seem strange in the eyes of Europeans, who had never seen anything of that kind. But if one examines the matter little, the philosophical reason of this disposition is very obvious. One may easily apprehend that if nature had placed such bulky fruit at the ends of the branches, their great weight must necessarily break them, and the fruit would fall before it came to maturity. The fruit of the cacao tree is contained in a husk or shell, which from an exceeding small beginning attains, in the space of four months, to the bigness and shape of a cucumber. The lower end is sharp and furrowed length weighs like a lemon. This shell in the first months is either red or white, or a mixture of red and yellow. This variety of colours makes three sorts of cacao trees, which have nothing else to distinguish them but this which I do not think sufficient to make in reality three different kinds of cacao nuts. The first is of a dark vinous red, chiefly on the sides, which becomes more bright and pale as the fruit ripens. The second, which is the white, or rather is at first of so pale a green, that it may be mistaken for white, by little and little it assumes a citron colour, which still growing deeper and deeper, at length becomes entirely yellow. The third, which is red and yellow mixed together, unites the properties of the other two, for as they grow ripe, the red becomes pale, and the yellow grows more deep. I have observed that the white shells are thick and shorter than the other, especially on the side towards the tree, and that these sorts of trees commonly bear most. If one cleaves one of these shells lengthways, it will appear almost half an inch thick, and its capacity full of chocolate kernels, the intervals of which, before they are ripe, are filled with a hard white substance, which at length turns into a mucilage of a very grateful acidity. For this reason, it is common for people to take some of the kernels with their covers, and hold them in their mouths, which is mighty refreshing, and proper to quench thirst. 
but they take heed of biting them, because the films of the kernels are extremely bitter. When one nicely examines the inward structure of these shells, and anatomizes, as it were, all their parts, one shall find that the fibres of the stalk of the fruit passing through the shell are divided into five branches, that each of these branches is subdivided into several filaments, every one of which terminates at the larger end of these kernels, and altogether resemble a bunch of grapes, containing from twenty to thirty-five single ones, or more, ranged and placed in an admirable order. I cannot help observing here what inconsistency there is in the accounts concerning the number of kernels in each shell. Dampier, for instance, says there is commonly near a hundred, other moderns, sixty, seventy, or eighty, ranged like the seeds of a pomegranate. Thomas Gage, thirty or forty, Colmenero, ten or twelve, and Oexmelin, ten or twelve to fourteen. I can affirm, after a thousand trials, that I never found more nor less than twenty-five. Perhaps if one was to seek out the largest shells in the most fruitful soil, and growing on the most flourishing trees, one might find forty kernels. But as it is not likely one should ever meet with more, so, on the other hand, it is not probable one should ever find less than fifteen, except they are abortive, or the fruit of a tree worn out with age in a barren soil, or without culture. When one takes off the film that covers one of the kernels, the substance of it appears, which is tender, smooth, and inclining to a violet colour, and is seemingly divided into several lobes, though in reality they are but two, but very irregular, and difficult to be disengaged from each other, which we shall explain more clearly in speaking of its vegetation. Oexmelin and several others have imagined that a cacao kernel was composed of five or six parts sticking fast together. Father Plumier himself fell into this error, and has led others into it. If the kernel be cut in two length ways, one finds at the extremity of the great end a kind of a longest grain, one-fifth of an inch long, and one-fourth part as broad, which is the germ, or first rudiments of the plant, but in European kernels this part is placed at the other end. One may even see in France this irregularity of the lobes and also the germ in the kernels that are roasted and cleaned to make chocolate. End of section 1 Recording by Michael Landu Section 2 of The Natural History of Chocolate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. de Quellis. The First Part, Chapter 2 Of the Choice and Disposition of the Place for Planting Cocoa Trees. The cocoa tree grows naturally in several countries in America under the torrid zone, but chiefly at Mexico, in the provinces of Nicaragua and Guatemala, as also along the banks of the river of the Amazons. Likewise upon the coast of Caraqua, that is to say, from Comana to Cartagena, and the Golden Island. Some also have been found in the woods of Bartonico. The Spaniards and Portuguese were the first to whom the Indians communicated the use of cocoa nuts, which they kept a long time to themselves without acquainting other nations with it, who in reality know so little of it at this day, that some Dutch corsairs, ignorant of the value of some prizes they had taken, out of contempt cast the merchandise into the sea, calling it in derision, in very indifferent Spanish, Caruca de Canero, the dung of beasts. In 1649, in the Vert Islands, they had never seen but one tree planted, which was in the garden of an Englishman, an inhabitant of the island of St. Croix. In 1655, the Caribbeans shewed to Monsieur de Parapet a cocoa tree in the woods of the island of Martinico, whereof he was governor. This discovery was the foundation of several others of the same kind, in the woods of the Cape Stera of this island, and it is probable that the kernels which were taken out of them were the original of those cocoa trees that have been planted there since. A Jew named Benjamin planted the first about the year 1660, but it was not till twenty or twenty-five years after 
that the inhabitants of Martinico applied themselves to the cultivation of cocoa trees and to raise nurseries of them. When one would raise a nursery, it is necessary above all things to choose a proper place in respect of situation and a soil agreeable to the nature of it. The place should be level, moist, and not exposed to winds, a fresh and, if one may be allowed the expression, a virgin soil, indifferently fat, light, and deep. For this reason, ground newly cleared, whose soil is black and sandy, which is kept moist by a river, and its borders so high as to shelter it from the winds, especially toward the sea coast, is preferable to any other, and they never fail putting it to this use, when they are so happy as to find any of this sort. I have said ground newly cleared, that is to say, whose wood is cut down purposely for it, for it is necessary to observe that they at present plant their nurseries in the middle of woods, which have been so time out of mind, and this for two weighty reasons. The first, because the wood that is left standing round it may serve as a shelter, and the second, because there is less trouble in weeding or grubbing it. The ground that has never produced any weeds will send forth but few for want of seed. As for nurseries planted in high ground, the earth is neither moist nor deep enough, and commonly the chief root which grows directly downwards cannot pierce the hard earth which it soon meets with. Besides, the winds are more boisterous and cause the blossoms to fall off as soon as blown, and when a little high, overturn the tree whose roots are almost all superficial. This is yet worse on the hills, whose descent is too steep, for besides the same inconveniencies, the falling down of the earth draws with it the good soil, and insensibly lays the roots bare. One may therefore conclude that all these nurseries are a long time before they bear, that they are never fruitful, and that they are destroyed in a little time. It is also proper that a nursery, as much as may be, should be surrounded with standing wood, but if it is open on any side, it should be remedied as soon as possible, by a border of several ranks of trees called bananes. Besides this, the nursery should be moderate in respect of magnitude, for the small have not air enough, and are, as it were, stifled, and the very large are too liable to dryness, and to the great winds, which in America they call oregons. The place of the nursery being chosen, and the bigness determined, they apply themselves to clear it of the wood. They begin with plucking up the little plants, and by cutting the shrubs, and small kinds of trees, and felling the trunks and larger branches of others. They then make piles, and set them on fire in all parts, and so burn down the largest trees of all, to save themselves the trouble of cutting them. When all is burnt, and there remains nothing upon the earth but the trunks of the great trees which they don't trouble themselves to consume, and when the space is well cleaned, they make alleys by the help of a line, straight and at equal distances from each other, and thrust sticks into the ground of two or three foot long, and five, six, seven, eight, nine, or ten feet distant, or at such a distance that they design to plant the cocoa trees, which they represent. Afterward they plant manioc in the empty spaces, taking care not to come too near the sticks. One may observe that the nurseries planted at the great distances of eight or ten feet are a great deal more troublesome to keep clean in the first years, as we shall observe hereafter. But then they prosper a great deal better, and bear more, and last longer. The inhabitants, who have a great deal to do, and have but few slaves, plant the trees nearer, because by this means they gain room, and they have less trouble to keep it clear. When afterwards the trees come to hurt and annoy each other by their proximity, and they have had some crops to supply their present necessities, or, if otherwise, they are obliged to cut some to give air to the rest. On the coast of Caracua, they plant the cocoa trees at twelve or fifteen feet distance, and they make trenches to water them from time to time in the dry seasons. They happily experienced the success of this practice at Martinico some years since. The manioc is a woody shrub whose roots, being grated and baked on the fire, yield a cassave, or meal, which serves to make bread for all the natives of America. They plant it in the new nurseries, not only because it is necessary to supply the negroes with food, but also it hinders the growth of weeds, and serves to shade the young cocoa trees, whose tender shoots, 
and even the second leaves are not able to resist the scorching beams of the sun. For this reason they wait till the manioc shades the feet of the sticks before they plant the cocoa trees, in the manner that we shall describe in the following chapter. End of section 2section three of the natural history of chocolate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by amelia chesley the natural history of chocolate by d de Quelles. chapter three of the method of planting a nursery and to cultivate it till the fruit comes to maturity Cocoa trees are planted from the kernel or seed, for the nature of the wood will not admit of slips. They open a cocoa shell, and according as they have occasion, take out the kernels and plant them one by one, beginning, for example, at the first stick. They pluck it up, and with a sort of setting stick made of iron and well sharpened, they make a hole, and turning the iron about, cut off the little roots that may do hurt. They plant the kernel three or four inches deep, and thrust in the stick they before had plucked up a little on one side, to serve as a mark, and so they proceed from stick to stick, and from rank to rank, till they have gone through the whole nursery. It must be observed, first, not to plant in a dry season. One may indeed plant in any month of the year, or any moon, new or old, when the season is cool, and the place ready, but it is commonly believed that planting from September to Christmas the trees bear more than in some months. Second, not to plant any but the largest kernels, and such as are plump, for since in the finest shells there are sometimes withered kernels, it would be very imprudent to make use of them. Third, to plant the great ends of the kernels lowermost. This is that which is held by a little thread to the center of the shell when one takes the kernel out. If the little end was placed downward, the foot of the tree would become crooked, neither would it prosper, and if it was placed sideways, the foot would not succeed very well. Fourth, to put two or three kernels at every stick, that if by any mischance the tender shoots of one or two are broken by insects or otherwise, there may be one left to supply the defect. If no bad accident happen, you have the advantage of choosing the straightest and most likely shoot but it is not best to cut up the supernumerary ones till that which is chosen is grown up, and according to all appearance, out of danger. The kernels come up in ten or twelve days, more or less, according as the season, more or less favorable, hastens or backens their growth. The longish grain of the germ beginning to swell sends forth a little root downwards, which afterwards becomes the chief stay of the tree, and upwards it pushes out the shoot, which is an epitome of the trunk and the branches. These parts increasing, and discovering themselves more and more, the two lobes of the kernel, a little separated and bent back, appear first out of the earth, and regain their natural position, in proportion as the shoot rises, and then separate themselves entirely, and become two leaves of a different shape, of an obscure green, thick, unequal, and as it were shriveled up, and make what they call the ears of the plant. The shoot appears at the same time, and is divided into two tender leaves of bright green. To these two first leaves, opposite to each other, succeed two more, and to these a third pair. The stalk or trunk rises in proportion, and thence forward during a year or thereabouts. The whole cultivation of the cocoa tree may then be reduced to the practice of two things. First, to overlook them during the first fifteen days that is to say, to plant new kernels in the room of those that do not come up, or whose shoots have been destroyed by insects, which very often make dreadful havoc among these plants, even when one would think they are out of danger. Some inhabitants make nurseries apart and transplant them to the places where they are wanting, but as they do not all grow, especially when they are a little too big, or the season not favorable, and because the greatest part of those that do grow languish a long time, it always seemed to me more proper to set fresh kernels, and I am persuaded if the consequences are duly weighed, it will be practiced for the future. Secondly, not to let any weeds grow in the nursery, but to cleanse it carefully from one end to the other, and taking care above all things not to let any herb or weed grow up to seed, for if it should happen so but once, it will be very difficult henceforwards 
to root those troublesome guests out and to keep the nursery clean, because the cold in this country never interrupts vegetation. This weeding should be continued till the trees are become large and their branches spreading, cast such a shade as to hinder the weeds from coming up, and afterwards the leaves falling from the trees and covering the earth will contribute to stifle them entirely. When this troublesome business of weeding is ended, it will be sufficient to overlook them once a month and pluck up here and there those few weeds that remain, and to carry them far into the woods for fear of seeds. When the cocoa trees are nine months old, the manioc should then begin to be plucked up, and it should be managed so that in three months' time there should be none left. There may be a row or two replanted in each alley, and cucumbers, citrals, and caramonts may be sowed in the void spaces, or Caribbean coal warts, because these plants, having great spreading leaves, are very proper to keep the earth cool and moist, and to stifle the noisome weeds. When the cocoa trees come to shade the ground entirely, then it will be necessary to pluck up everything, for nothing will grow beneath them. The cocoa trees of one year old have commonly a trunk of four feet high, and begin to spread by sending out five branches at the top, all at a time, which forms that which they call the crown of a cocoa tree. It seldom happens that any of these five branches are wanting, and if by any accident, or contrary to the order of nature, it has but three or four, the tree never comes to good, and it will be better to cut it off and wait for a new crown, which will not be long before it is formed. If at the end of the year the manioc is not plucked up, they will make the trees be more slow in bearing, and their trunks running up too high will be weak, slender, and more exposed to the winds. If they should be crowned, their crowns will be too close, and the chief branches not opening themselves enough, the trees will never be sufficiently disengaged and will not spread so much as they ought to. When all the trunks are crowned, they choose the finest shoots and cut up the supernumerary ones without mercy. For if this is not done out of hand, it will be difficult to persuade oneself afterwards, though it is not possible but that trees placed so near each other should be hurtful to each other in the end. The trees are no sooner crowned, but they send forth from time to time an inch or two above the crown new shoots, which they call suckers. If nature was permitted to play her part, these suckers would soon produce a second crown, that again new suckers, which will produce a third, etc. Thus the cocoa trees proceed that are wild and uncultivated, which are found in the woods of Cape Stara in Martinico. But seeing all these crowns do but hinder the growth of the first, and almost bring it to nothing, though it is the principle, and that the tree, if left to itself, runs up too high and becomes too slender, they should take care every month when they go to weed it, or gather the fruit to prune it, that is to say, to cut or lop off all the suckers. I don't know whether they have yet thought it proper to prune any more than to graft upon cocoa trees. There is, however, a sort of pruning which, in my opinion, would be very advantageous to it. These sort of trees, for example, have always, some more than others, dead branches upon them, chiefly upon the extremities of the boughs, and there is no room to doubt but it would be very proper to lop off these useless branches, paring them off with the pruning knife even to the quick. But as the advantage that will accrue from it will neither be so immediate nor so apparent as the time and pains that is employed in it, it is very probable that this care will be neglected, and that it will be esteemed as labor lost. But, however, the Spaniards do not think so, for on the contrary they are very careful to cut off all the dead sprigs, for which reason their trees are more flourishing than ours, and yield much finer fruit. I believe that they have not the same care in grafting them, nor do I think any person has hitherto attempted it. I am persuaded, nevertheless, that the cocoa trees would be better for it. It is not by the assistance of grafting our fruit trees in several manners, which were originally wild and found by chance in the woods, that they have at length found the art of making them bear such excellent fruit. In proportion as the cocoa trees grow, the leaves upon the trunks fall off by little and little, which ought to fall off on their own accord for when they are entirely bare, they have not long to flourish. The first blossoms commonly fall off, and the ripe fruit is not to be expected in less time than three years, and that if it be in a good soil. The fourth year the crop is moderate, and the fifth it is as great as ever will it be. For then the trees commonly bear all the year about, and have blossoms and fruit of all ages. 
Some months, indeed, there is almost none, and others they are loaded, and toward the solstices, that is, in June and December, they bear the most. As in the tempests called orangans, the wind blows from all points of the compass in twenty-four hours, it will be well if it does not break in at the weakest place of the nursery and do a great deal of mischief, which it is necessary to remedy with all possible expedition. If the wind has only overturned the trees without breaking the chief root, then the best method that can be taken in good soil is to raise them up again and put them in their places, propping them up with a fork, and putting in the earth about it very carefully. By this means they will be re-established in less than six months, and they will bear again as if no harm had come to them. In bad soil it will be better to let them lie, putting the earth about their roots and cultivate at their lower parts, or feet, the best-grown sucker, and that which is nearest the roots, cutting off carefully all the rest. The tree in this condition will not give over blossoming and bearing fruit, and when in two years' time the sucker has become a new tree, the old tree must be cut off half a foot distant from the sucker. End of chapter 3 Section 4 of the Natural History of Chocolate This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Natural History of Chocolate by D. de Quellis The First Part Chapter 4 of the gathering of the cacao nuts, and of the manner of making the kernels sweat, and of drying them that they may be transported into Europe. The observations which we made in the first chapter concerning the alterations of the color of the nuts give us information of the time that they become ripe. It will be proper to gather them when all the shell has changed color, and when there is but a small spot below which shall remain green. They go from tree to tree and from row to row, and with forked sticks or poles they cause the ripe nuts to fall down, taking great care not to touch those that are not so, as well as the blossoms. They employ the most handy negroes in this work, and others follow them with baskets to gather them, and lay them in heaps where they remain four days without being touched. In the months that they bear most, they gather them for a fortnight together. In the less fruitful seasons, they only gather them from month to month. If the kernels were left in shells more than four days, they would sprit or begin to grow and be quite spoiled. Footnote Why? It is therefore necessary to shell them on the fifth day in the morning at the farthest. To do this, they strike on the middle of the shells with a bit of wood to cleave them and then pull them open with their fingers, and take out the kernels, which they put in baskets, casting the empty shells upon the ground, that they may with the leaves, being putrefied, serve to fatten the earth, and supply the place of dung. They afterwards carry all the kernels into a house, and lay them on a heap upon a kind of loose floor covered with leaves of Belize. Footnote 7 which are about four feet long and twenty inches broad. Then they surround it with planks covered with the same leaves, making a kind of granary, which may contain the whole pile of kernels when spread abroad. They cover the whole with the like leaves and lay some planks over all. The kernels thus laid on a heap and covered close on all sides do not fail to grow warm by the fermentation of their insensible particles. And this is what they call sweating in those parts. They uncover the kernels morning and evening, and send the negroes among them, who with their feet and hands turn them topsy-turvy, and then cover them up as before, with the same leaves and the same planks. They continue to do this for five days, at the end of which they have commonly sweat enough, which is discovered by their color, which grows a great deal deeper and very ruddy. The more the kernels sweat, the more they lose their weight and bitterness, but if they have not sweat enough, they are more bitter and smell sour and sometimes sprit. To succeed well, therefore, 
there should be a certain medium observed, which is only to be learned by use. When the kernels have sweat enough, they lay them out to air, and expose them to the sun to dry them, in the manner following. They prepare beforehand several benches about two foot high in an even court appointed for that purpose. They lay upon these benches several mats made of pieces of reeds split into two, together with bands made of meho bark. Footnote 8. Upon these mats they put the kernels about two inches in height and move and turn them very often with the proper piece of wood for the first two days. At night they wrap up the kernels in the mats, which they cover with Belize leaves for fear of rain, and they do the same in the daytime when it is likely to rain. Those who are afraid of having them stolen lock them up. There are some inhabitants who keep boxes about five feet long and two broad and three or four inches deep on purpose to dry the kernels. There is this advantage in them that in the greatest rains and suddenest showers they may presently be piled one on the top of another so that none but the topmost will want a cover, which is soon done with the aforesaid leaves, and an empty box turned upside down. But that which makes the usage of mats preferable is that the air may pass through beneath, between the partition of the reeds, and so the kernels dry better. Boxes whose bottoms are made like a sieve with strong brass wire would be very excellent, but then they must be made in Europe, which would be a considerable charge. When the kernels have sweat enough, they must be exposed upon the mats as much as necessary. If rain is foreseen that is likely to last, it will be best to let them sweat half a day less. It is observable that a few hours rain at first, instead of doing any harm, makes them more beautiful and better conditioned. In fair weather, instead of this rain, it will be proper to expose them to the dew for the first nights. The rain of a whole day or two will do no harm if they are not covered before they have had the benefit of the sun, for a day or half a day at least. For after a day's sunshine, they are to be wrapped in the mats, as before directed. But if it be half a day's rain only, then they are only covered with Belize leaves in the night, kept on with little stones laid at each end, but if the rain be too long, it makes them split, and then they will not keep long. They therefore make chocolate of it immediately. If the kernels have not sweat enough, or they rub them too soon in the mat, they are subject to sprit or germ which makes them bitter and good for nothing. When the kernels have been once wrapped in a mat and begun to dry, care must be taken that they do not grow moist again. They must therefore be well stirred from time to time that they may be thoroughly dried, which you may know by taking a handful in your hand and shutting it. If it cracks, then it is time to put them into your storehouse and to expose them to sale. Those who would gain a reputation in giving out a good merchandise before they pack it up in vessels, pick it and throw aside the little, withered and thin kernels, which are not only unsightly, but render the chocolate something worse. Afterwards, the kernels of the cacao nut are dried in the sun before they are brought to Europe and sold by the druggists and the grocers, who distinguish it into great and small and into that of Caracua, or that of French Islands, though with no good foundation, for in the places themselves they make no mention of this distinction. It therefore seems likely that the merchants find their account in sorting it, since kernels proceeding from the same tree and from the same nuts are not always of the same bigness. It is indeed true that if one parcel of kernels be compared with another, the one may consist of bigger than the other, which may arise from the age or vigour of the trees, or from the nature of the soil. But certainly there is no kind of kernels which may be called great, 
as a distinct kind, nor consequently no other which can properly be said to be small. The kernels that come to us from the coast of Caracua are more oily and less bitter than those that come from the French islands, and in France and Spain they prefer them to these latter. But in Germany and in the north, fides sit penis autorem, they have a quite opposite taste. Several people mix that of Caracua with that of the islands, half in half, and pretend by this mixture to make the chocolate better. I believe in the bottom. The difference of chocolates is not considerable, since they are only obliged to increase or diminish the proportion of sugar, according as the bitterness of the kernels require it. For it must be considered, as we have already said, that there is but one kind of cacao tree, which grows as naturally in the woods of Martinico as in those of the coast of Caracua, that the climates are almost the same, and consequently the temperature of the seasons equal, and therefore there cannot be any intrinsic difference between these fruits of any great moment. As to the outward difference that is observed, it can arise from nothing but the richness of the soil, or the contrary, from the different culture, and from the care or negligence of the laborers and those that prepare it, from the time of its gathering to the time of its delivery, and perhaps all three together. It is to be observed at Martinico that the cacao trees prosper better in some parts than others, merely from the difference of the soil being more or less rich, or more or less moist. I have had the experience of one of my friends concerning what relates to the cultivation and preparation of this tree and its fruit, which demonstrates that they may add to its value. This gentleman, with a great deal of application and thought, found out the way to prepare the finest merchandise of the island, which was preferred by the merchants to all the rest, and bore a greater price than that of any of his neighbors. The kernels of Caracua are flattish and for bulk and figure not unlike our large beans. Those of St. Domingo, Jamaica and Cuba are generally larger than those of the Antilles. The more bulky the kernels are and better they have been nourished, the less waste there is after they have been roasted and cleansed, which some years ago was an advantage to those of Caracua. But at present, by the regulation from the month of April 1717, the kernels of our colonies pay but two pence duty for entry, whereas foreigners pay always fifteen. These thirteen pence difference make such ample amends for the small waste that there is a great deal of reason to hope that for the time to come there will be none but the curious and people that do not value the expense that will make use of the chocolate of Caracua, by way of preference to that of the French islands, and that the cheapness of the latter will double the consumption at least. The best cacao nuts have very brown, firm shells, and when the kernel is taken out, it ought to be plump, well nourished and sleek, of the color of a hazelnut on the outside, but more inclining to a red within. Its taste a little bitter and astringent, not at all sour or moldy. Footnote Z. In a word, without any smell and not warm eaten. The fruit of the cacao tree is the moist oily that nature has produced, and it has this admirable prerogative never to grow rank, let it be ever so old, which all other fruit do that are analogous to it in qualities such as nuts, almonds, pineapple kernels, pistachio nuts, olives, etc. There are also imported from America cacao kernel cakes of about a pound weight each, and as this preparation is the first and principal in the composition of chocolate, it will be proper to add here the manner of making it. The Indians, from whom we borrow it, are not very nice in doing it, they roast the kernels in earthen pots, then free them from their skins 
and afterwards crush and grind them between two stones and so form cakes of it with their hands. The Spaniards, more industrious than the savages, and at this day other nations after their example, choose out the best kernels, footnote A, and the most fresh. Of these they put about two pounds in a great iron shovel over a clear fire, stirring them continually with a large spatula, so long that they may be roasted enough to have their skins come off easily, which should be done one by one. Footnote B. Laying them apart and staking great heat that the rotten and mouldy kernels be thrown away, and all that comes off the good ones. For these skins, being left among the chocolates, will not dissolve in any liquor, nor even in the stomach, and fall to the bottom of chocolate cups, as if the kernels had not been cleansed. If one was curious to weigh the kernels at the druggists, and then weigh them again after they are roasted and cleansed, one should find that there would be about six part wasted, more or less according to the nature and qualities of the kernels. That is to say, if you bought, for example, 30 pounds, there would remain entirely cleansed near 25. All of the kernels being thus roasted and cleansed at diverse times, they put them once more to roast in the same iron shovel, put over a more gentle fire, and stir them with the spatula without ceasing till they are roasted all alike, and as much as they ought to be, which one may discover by their taste and their dark brown color without being black. The whole art consists in avoiding the two extremes, of not roasting them enough and roasting them too much, that is to say, till they are burnt. If they are not roasted enough, they retain a disagreeable harshness of taste, and if they are roasted so much as to burn them, besides the bitterness and ill taste that they contract, they lose their oiliness entirely, and the best part of their good qualities. In France, where they are very apt to run into extremes, they are mighty fond of the bird taste, and the black color, as if they were proper marks of good chocolate, not considering that, quantity for quantity, they may as well put so much charcoal as burnt chocolate. This opinion is not only agreeable to reason and good sense, but is also confirmed by the unanimous consent of all that have written on this subject, and I can affirm that it is authorized by the universal consent of all America. When the kernels are duly roasted and well cleansed, they put them into a large mortar to reduce them into a gross powder, which they afterwards grind upon a stone till it is very fine, which requires a more particular explanation. They make a choice of a stone which naturally resists the fire, not so soft as to rub away easily, nor so hard as to endure polishing. They cut it from 16 to 18 inches broad, and about 27 or 30 long, and 3 in thickness, and hollowed in the middle about an inch and a half deep. This stone should be fixed upon a frame of wood or iron, a little higher on one side than the other. Under, they place a pan of coals to heat the stone, so that the heat melting the oily parts of the kernels and reducing it to the consistence of honey, makes it easy for the iron roller which they make use of for the sake of its strength. They make it so fine as to leave neither lump nor the least hardness. This roller is a cylinder of polished iron, two inches in diameter and about eighteen long, having at each end a wooden handle of the same thickness and six inches long for the workman to hold by. When the paste is ground as much as is thought necessary, they put it hot in moulds made of tin, where they leave it and it becomes hard in a very little time. The shape of these moulds is arbitrary, and every one may have them made according to his fancy, but the cylindric ones, which will hold about two or three pounds of chocolate, seem to me the most proper, because the thicker they are, the longer they keep good, 
and may be commodiously held when there is occasion to scrape them. These rolls ought to be wrapped in paper and kept in a dry place. It should also be observed that they are very susceptible of good and ill smells, and that it is good to keep them five or six months before they are used. Now, the kernels being sufficiently rubbed and ground upon the stone, as we have just directed, if you would complete the composition in the mass, it is nothing more to be done than to add to this paste a powder sifted through a fine sears, composed of sugar, cinnamon, and if it be desired, of vanilla. Footnote C. According to the quantities and proportions which we shall teach in the third part of this treatise, and mix it well upon the stone, the better to blend it and incorporate it together, and then to fashion it in moulds made of tin in the form of lozenges of about four ounces each, or if desired, half a pound. Footnotes Why? For this reason, when they would send cacao nuts to the neighboring islands from Martinico, that they may have wherewithal to plant, they are very careful not to gather them till the transport vessel is ready to sail, and to make use of them as soon as they arrive. For this reason also, it is not possible that the Spaniards, when they design to preserve nuts for planting, should let them be withered and perfectly dry, and that afterwards they should take the kernels of these same nuts and dry them very carefully in the shade, and after all, raise a nursery with them, as Oixmillen reports, History of Adventurers, Tome 1, page 424. 7. See the seventh note hereafter. 8. The Meho is a shrub whose leaves are round and feel soft like those of Gimov. Its bark easily comes up, which they divide into long slangs, which serves for back thread and cords to the inhabitants and natives. Z. It gets this taste either by being laid in a moist place or by being wet by sea water in the passage. A. As the kernels are never so clean, but they may be stones, earth, and bad ones among them, it will be necessary, before they are used, to sift them in a sieve that will let these things pass through, while it retains the kernels. B. The artists, to make this work more expeditious and to gain time, put a thick mat upon a table and spread the kernels upon it as they come hot from the shovel, and roll a roller of iron over them to crack and cut off the skins of the kernels. Afterward, they winnow all in a splinter seed till the kernels become entirely cleansed. See, what this is you will find hereafter. End of section 4section 5 of the natural history of chocolate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the natural history of chocolate by d the kellos of the old prejudices against chocolate to proceed more methodically and with greater clearness in our inquiries concerning chocolate, it seems proper to set people right about the prejudices which a false philosophy has instilled into most authors who have wrote upon this subject. The impressions whereof are yet very deeply engraven in the minds of a great number of people. The Spaniards, who were first acquainted with chocolate after the conquest of the New World, have laid it down for an undoubted truth that chocolate is cold and dry, participating of the nature of earth. They have supported this determination neither with reason nor experience, nor do they know from whence they learn it. Perhaps they have taken it upon the words and from the tradition of the inhabitants of the country. Let that be as it will. It is natural from false principles to draw false conclusions. 
of which the two principal are as follow the first is that chocolate being by nature cold it ought not to be used without being mixed with the spices which are commonly hot that so they might both together become temperate and wholesome this was the jargon and practice of those times for the same reason the ancient physicians erroneously imagining that opium was cold in the fourth degree never failed to correct this pretended coldness in their narcotic compositions with drugs extremely hot as euphorbium pellitory pepper etc their second conclusion was that chocolate being dry and earthy and from thence supposed to be of a styptic and astringent quality if it was not corrected must necessarily breed obstructions in the viscera and bring on a cacochyme and a great number of other incurable diseases these prejudices have from the spaniards passed into other nations to prove this it would be unnecessary to cite a great number of authors for whoever has read one has read them all the latter having done nothing but copy the former they have even sometimes improved their dreams and exaggerated this pretended coldness of chocolate and at length pushed the matter so far as to make it a kind of cold poison and if it was taken to excess it would bring on a consumption mexiaci frigit nativa cocai temperis tantoc excedit frigore ut inter noxia ne dubitem glandes sensere venena tom et strose de mentis potus seu de cocolatis opificio lib three hinc sequis solo cocolatis fomite vitam extrat atque asueta neget tibi prandia sensim contraet exueto marchentem corporatabem it is not very extraordinary that people who are more ready to believe than to examine such as the world is full of should give in to the unanimous opinion of so many authors and it would be strange if they were not carried down by the stream of a prejudice so general but i cannot sufficiently admire that chocolate being so much decried has not been entirely laid aside as unfit for use without doubt there was nothing but the daily experience of its good effects which could support it and hinder it from giving away to calumny now to overturn this old system it is sufficient in my opinion to observe with how little skill and penetration they then treated of the whole natural history one ought not to be amazed that they have affirmed chocolate to be cold and dry in an age when for example they could say Confer was cold and moist, which is a kind of resin. From hence one drop of water cannot be extracted, whose sharp taste and penetrating smell join into the extreme volatility and inflammability of its particles. Even in water itself are such evident signs of its heat that it is difficult to conceive upon what account they persuade themselves of the contrary the qualities of chocolate are not indeed so remarkable nor so active as those of camphire but with the least attention one may easily discern that the quantity of oil that it contains and the bitterness that is perceivable in tasting are not the marks of coldness since all bitters are esteemed hot and since oil is a matter very near akin to and necessary for fire this is very near the reasoning of a celebrated physician at rome against the old opinion as for me says he i am of another judgment i believe that chocolate is rather temperate than cold and i refer myself to the decision of every ingenious person it will be at the pains to taste and examine it 
These reflections will be further confirmed in the first section of the following chapter, where we shall experimentally demonstrate that chocolate is a substance very temperate, yielding soft and wholesome nourishment, incapable of doing any harm. And if this intrinsic coldness is no more to be feared, it must be owned that it will be henceforward ridiculous, if not pernicious, to join it with hot, acrid spices, more likely to alter and destroy its good and real qualities than to correct the bad ones which it has not. I nevertheless do not doubt but the pleasantness of the smell and the favorite taste of several agreeable spices, being pretty much like it in this mixture, will have their partisans, who more delighted with a present gratification than afraid of the insensible prejudice that these ingredients bring to their health, will not resolve to leave them off. To these will be no longer the correctors of chocolate, yet they will serve to season it, with which they will please their taste, without troubling themselves with the consequences. But those persons will give themselves the trouble of thinking, and are more tractable and less sensual, will wisely abstain from such extremes, and their moderation will not be unattended with benefit. Health is so valuable a blessing that the care to gain and preserve it ought to supersede any other consideration. As to the pretended obstructions which chocolate is said to occasion from its astrictive quality, they are so far from being afraid of it in America that they have found by experience a virtue directly contrary to it. For several young women subject to the whites have been cured of this distemper by eating a dozen cocoa kernels for breakfast every morning. It is well enough that known that obstructions are the cause of this disease, which instead of being increased by chocolate, were entirely taken away. Then as to those strange disorders, which are said to arise from its immoderate use, we shall bring in the sequel so many facts directly contrary to these chimerical fears, that all persons of good sense will be disabused, and convinced of the salutary and wonderful properties of this fruit, which shall be the subject of the following chapter. End of section 5「Section 6 of The Natural History of Chocolate」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaí in February 2017 The Natural History of Chocolate by The Quillis The Second Part, Chapter 2 of the real properties of chocolate. Without talking in the dialect of the peripatetics about the qualities of heat and coldness, nowadays so much decried, it will not be difficult to prove that chocolate is a substance, one, very temperate, two, very nourishing and of easy digestion, three, very proper to repair the exhausted spirits and decayed strength, Four, lastly, very suitable to preserve the health and prolong the lives of old men. These four articles shall be sufficiently demonstrated in the four following sections. Section 1. Chocolate is very temperate. Nothing is so great an argument that wheat, rice, millet, and manioc are salutary and temperate, as they are being used by whole nations together. If any of these substances had any predominant evil quality, it would soon appear to the prejudice of the health of numbers. The people who subsist upon it would soon leave it off as a very dangerous and hurtful element. One may reason much after the same manner with respect to chocolate. The natives of New Spain and of a great part of the torrid zone of America 
have always used it as a delicacy and at this day all the european colonies which are established in those countries make a consumption of vast quantities of it these people use it at all times and in all seasons as constant daily food without regard to age sex temperament or condition without complaint of having received the least prejudice from it they find on the contrary that it quenches thirst is very refreshing and feeding that it procures easy quiet sleep and produces several other good effects to say nothing of those we are going to treat of in the following sections i could produce several instances in favour of this excellent nourishment but i shall content myself with two only equally certain and decisive in the proof of its goodness the first is an experiment of chocolates being taken for the only nourishment made by a surgeon's wife of martinico she had lost by a very deplorable accident her lower jaw which reduced her to such a condition that she did not know how to subsist she was not capable of taking anything solid and not rich enough to live upon jellies and nourishing broths in this strait she determined to take three dishes of chocolate prepared after the manner of the country one in the morning one at noon and one at night there chocolate is nothing else but cacao kernels dissolved in hot water with sugar and seasoned with a bit of cinnamon this new way of life succeeded so well that she has lived a long while since more lively and robust than before this accident i had the second relation from a gentleman of martinico and one of my friends not capable of a falsity he assured me that in his neighbourhood an infant of four months old unfortunately lost his nurse and its parents not being able to put it to another resolved through necessity to feed it with chocolate the success was very happy for the infant came on to a miracle and was neither less healthy nor less vigorous than those who are brought up by the best nurses the inferences that may be drawn from these two histories are evident and demonstratively prove that chocolate has neither any intemperate nor hurtful quality i shall therefore say no more upon them leaving every one to make his own proper reflections section two chocolate is very nourishing and of easy digestion this proposition is a necessary consequence of the foregoing established by facts which i have just related and we have experiments as convincing of its easy digestion and the goodness of the cycle that it makes but it needs no other proof than the good condition it puts those in who ordinarily make use of it a learned englishman has carried his commendations so high concerning this particular property of chocolate that he has not scrupled to affirm in a dissertation that he has published upon this subject that one ounce of chocolate contains as much nourishment as a pound of beef as much out of the way as this assertion seems to be one may easily conceive that any element is capable of yielding more plentiful nourishment if compared with any other not only in respect to the quantity but also with relation to the time that the stomach takes to digest it physicians are not agreed about the causes of digestion but are divided into two opinions each of which is supported by the writings of very eminent authors convinced of my own inability to decide the controversy which also requires a large field to expatiate in i shall not undertake to defend either fermentation or trituration but it will be sufficient to say in two words that these opinions are not absolutely incompatible it perhaps will not be difficult to make a sort of an alliance or agreement between them by uniting whatever is plain and evident in the two systems and rejecting what is otherwise and from hence form a third which will be nothing but the union of the uncontested parts of the other two these two causes undoubtedly concur in the alteration that the element undergoes in the mouth for the saliva that mixes with it in mastication and dilutes it cannot be denied to be an admirable ferment and the tongue which moves it and the teeth which grind it and break it 
must be owned to be the first instruments of trituration. Now, since nature is commonly uniform in her operations, and since there is a great deal of reason to suppose that nature completes digestion by the same means that she has begun it, let us suppose it is really so for a moment, and apply it to the present subject, and then we shall see by what evidence chocolate ought to be of an easy digestion. In the first place, bitter and alkaline substances, such as these kernels, are stomachic and analogous to the saliva and the ferment which dissolves the element in the stomach. How then can it be of hard digestion with these qualities? In the second place, if one considers attentively the kernels as they are roasted, broke and ground extremely fine upon a stone, afterwards melted and dissolved in boiling liquor, which serves as a vehicle for it, it then seems very likely that the stomach will not have much labour left to do. In short, by it digestion is more than half finished. Experience confirms these reasonings very much, for the digestion of chocolate is soon brought about without trouble, without difficulty, and without any sensible rising of the pulse. The stomach, very far from making use of its strength, acquires new force. And I can farther say, upon my own knowledge, that I have seen several persons who had but weak digestion, if not quite spoiled, who have been entirely recovered by the frequent use of chocolate. Section 3. Chocolate speedily repairs the dissipated spirits and decayed strength. If chocolate did not produce this effect, but only as it is very nourishing, it would but have this property in common with the most juicy elements, and such as are most proper to furnish a good quantity of blood and plenty of spirits. But its effects are more speedy, for if a person, for example, fatigued with long and hard labour, or with a violent agitation of mind, takes a good dish of chocolate, he shall perceive almost instantly that his faintness shall cease and his strength shall be recovered, when digestion is hardly begun. This truth is confirmed by experience, though not so easily explained by reasoning, because chocolate sensibly appears to be soft, heavy, and very little disposed by any active quality to put the spirits in motion. However, being resolved to neglect nothing that is likely to unfold the cause of an effect so wonderful, I undertook one day the chemical analysis of chocolate, and although prejudiced that I should discover nothing this way but a superficial knowledge, yet I was willing to flatter myself that my inquiry would not be wholly fruitless. I cleansed sixteen ounces of kernels without burning them. I ground them in a marble mortar, and afterwards put them in a glass retort well looted. I placed it in a reverberatory furnace, and fixed to it a large receiver, and after having looted the joints well, I gave it the first degree of fire. The first that ascended was pure flame, which dropped for about two hours. A little white unctuous matter swam on the top of it. The fire being augmented, the drops became red and congealed as they fell into the receiver. This lasted about two hours. The fire being again augmented, the receiver was filled with white clouds, which I saw resolve into a kind of dew, white and unctuous, which was partly spirit and partly a white oil. The red drops, however, continued to the end, which was about two hours and a half. This operation let me know that chocolate contains two kinds of oil, the one red and fixed, which congealed itself on the side of the vessel and the other white and volatile, which proceeded from the white clouds and resolved itself on the other side of the receiver. On the morrow after, having unluted the receiver and having placed it in Balneo Marie to melt the congealed matter, I was agreeably surprised to see the vessel immediately filled with white clouds. I very much admired the volatility of this unctuosity, and I was fully convinced that chocolate contained that volatile oil so highly esteemed in medicine, and that one need not go farther to seek the cause of the speedy reparation of the fainting spirits, 
which is confirmed by the daily experience of those that use chocolate. Having separated the spirit by filtering through brown paper, I divided the butrious matter into two parts. I put one, without any addition, into a little glass cucurbit, which I placed in a sand heat to rectify it, and by this operation I got an oil of an amber colour, swimming upon a little fling or spirit. I melted the remaining part, and, having incorporated it with quicklime, I put it into a little glass retort looted, and put fire to it by degrees. There first came over a clear oil, the white clouds succeeded, and at length the reddish butter. Having unluted the recipient, and put all in a little cucurbit in a sand heat, the white clouds yielded an oil of an amber colour, and having augmented the fire, there came over a little red oil, but no spirit. The amber-coloured oil is nothing else but the white volatile oil, coloured a little by the violence of the fire. As for the red oil, it seems to be the remainder of the red butter, fit to be exalted. These two oils will not mix together, for the red, more fixed than the other, always gets to the bottom. Mr. Boyle said he extracted from human blood two oils very like those above mentioned, and this conformity of substances very much convinces me of the great analogy I always supposed to be between chocolate and human blood. As for the spirit, it has nothing very disagreeable either in taste or smell. It does not sensibly ferment with alkalis, nor alters the colour of blue paper. After some time it grows a little acid and tastes a little tartish. Having calcined the caput mortuum, which is of a violet colour, and filtered and evaporated the lixivium, as is usual, I got nothing from it but a kind of cinder, a little saltish, and in so small a quantity that I did not give myself the trouble to reiterate the calcination, dissolution, filtration, and evaporation, for I should hardly have got five or six grains of fixed purified salt. I curiously observed that neither in the heads nor in the receivers did it appear any signs of a volatile salt. However, M. Lemery assures us that it contains a good deal, but it is plain he took his opinion upon trust, for had he made the experiment, he is too ingenious to be mistaken. One may then conclude from these two observations that chocolate is a mixed body, that has the least quantity of salt enters its composition. Section 4. Chocolate is very proper to preserve health and to prolong the life of old men. Before chocolate was known in Europe, good old wine was called the milk of old men, but this title is now applied with greater reason to chocolate, since its use has become so common that it has been perceived that chocolate is, with respect to them, what milk is to infants. In reality, if one examines the nature of chocolate, a little with respect to the constitution of aged persons, it seems as though the one was made on purpose to remedy the defects of the other, and that it is truly the panacea of old age. Our life, as a famous physician observes, is, as it were, a continual growing dry, but yet this kind of natural consumption is imperceptible to an advanced age. When the radical moisture is consumed more sensibly, then the more balmy and volatile parts of the blood are dissipated by little and little, the salts disengaging from the sulphurs manifest themselves, the acid appears, which is the fruitful source of chronic diseases. The ligaments, the tendons, and the cartilages have scarce any of the unctuosity left, which rendered them so supple and so pliant in youth. The skin grows wrinkled as well within as without. In a word, all the solid parts grow dry or bony. One may say that nature has formed chocolate with every virtue proper to remedy these inconveniences. The volatile sulphur with which it abounds is proper to supply the place of that which the blood loses every day through age. It blunts and sheaths the points of the salts, 
and restores the usual softness to the blood, like a spirit of wine united with spirit of salt, makes a soft liquor of a violent corrosive. This same sulphurous unctuosity at the same time spreads itself in the solid parts, and gives them, in some sense, their natural suppleness. It bestows on the membranes, the tendons, the ligaments, and the cartilages a kind of oil which renders them smooth and flexible. Thus the equilibrium between the fluids and the solids is in some measure re-established, the wheels and springs of our machine mended, health is preserved, and life prolonged. These are not the consequences of philosophical reflections, but of a thousand experiments which mutually confirm each other, among a great number of which the following alone shall suffice. There lately died at Martinico a counsellor about a hundred years old, who, for thirty years past, lived on nothing but chocolate and biscuit. He sometimes indeed had a little soup at dinner, but never any fish, flesh, or other victuals. He was, nevertheless, so vigorous and nimble that at fourscore and five he could get on horseback without stirrups. Chocolate is not only proper to prolong the life of aged people, but also of those whose constitution is lean and dry, or weak and cacochimical, or who use violent exercises, or whose employments oblige them to an intense application of mind, which makes them very faintish. To all these it agrees perfectly well, and becomes to them an altering diet. On the contrary, I would not counsel the daily use of it to such who are very fat, or who are wont to drink a good deal of wine and live upon a juicy diet, or who sleep much and use no exercise at all, in a word, who lead a delicate, sedentary, and indolent life, such as a great many people of condition at Paris are used to. Such bodies as these, full of blood and juice, have no need of additional nourishment, and the diet will fit them better, which is mentioned in Ecclesiastics. Plentiful feeding brings diseases, and excess hath killed numbers, but the temperate man prolongs his days. End of section 6section seven of the natural history of chocolate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by amy graymore the natural history of chocolate by d de Quilis. the third part chapter one of chocolate in confections they choose cacao nuts that are half ripe and take out the kernels one by one for fear of spoiling them then they lay them to soak for some days in spring water which they take care to change morning and evening afterwards having taken them out and wiped them they lard them with little bits of citron bark and cinnamon almost as they make the nuts of ruin in the meantime they prepare a syrup of the finest sugar but very clear that is to say, wherein there is but little sugar, and after it has been clarified and purified, they take it boiling hot off the fire and put in the cacao kernels, and let them lie twenty-four hours. They repeat this operation six or seven times, increasing every time the quantity of sugar, without putting it on the fire or doing anything else to it. Last of all, they boil another syrup to the consistence of sugar, and pour it on the kernels well wiped and put in a clean earthen pot and when the syrup is almost cold they mix it with some drops of the essence of amber when they would have these in a dry form they take them out of the syrup and after it is well drained from them they put them into a basin full of a very strong clarified syrup then they immediately put it in a stove or hothouse where they candy it this confection which nearly resembles the nuts of ruin is excellent to strengthen the stomach without heating it too much. For this reason, they may safely be given to those who are ill of a fever. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Natural History of Chocolate This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. De Quellis. The Third Part, Chapter 2. Of Chocolate So Properly Called. In treating of this liquor, we have two things to examine. The first is the original of chocolate and the different manner of preparing it. The second, the medicinal uses that it is proper for, which shall be the subject of the two following sections. Section 1. Of the original of chocolate and the different manners of preparing it. Chocolate is originally an American drink, which the Spaniards found very much in use at Mexico when they conquered it about the year 1520. The Indians, who have used this drink time out of mind, prepared it without any great art. They roasted their kernels in earthen pots, then ground them between two stones, diluted them with hot water, and seasoned them with pimento. Those who were more curious added achiota, to give it a color, and atoya, to augment its substance. All these things joined together to give the composition so strange a look and so odd a taste that a Spanish soldier said it was more fit to be thrown to hogs than presented to men, and that he could never have accustomed himself to it if the want of wine had not forced him to it, that he might not always be obliged to drink nothing but water. The Spaniards taught by the Mexicans and convinced by their own experience that this drink, as rustic as it appeared to them, nevertheless yielded a wholesome nourishment, tried to make it more agreeable by the addition of sugar, some oriental spices, and things that grew there, which it will be needless to mention, because the names of them are not so much as known here, and because of so many ingredients there is none continued down to us but vanilla, in like manner that cinnamon is the only spice which has had general approbation and remains in the composition of chocolate. Vanilla is a cod of a brown color and delicate smell. It is flatter and longer than our French beans. It contains a luscious substance, full of little black shining grains. They must be chosen fresh, full, and well-grown and care must be taken that they are not smeared with balsam, nor put in a moist place. The agreeable smell and exquisite taste that they communicate to chocolate have prodigiously recommended it, but long experience have taught that it heats very much, its use is become less frequent, and those who prefer their health more than pleasing their senses abstain from it entirely. In Spain and Italy, chocolate prepared without vanilla is called at present chocolate of health, and in the French islands of America, where vanilla is neither scarce nor dear as in Europe, they do not use it at all, though they consume as much chocolate there as in any other place in the world. However, a great many people are prejudiced in favor of vanilla, and that I may pay a due deference to their judgments, I shall employ vanilla in the composition of chocolate in the best method and quantity, as it appears to me, I say as it appears to me because there are an infinite variety of tastes, and every one expects that we should have regard to his, and one person is for adding what the other rejects. Besides, when it is agreed upon what things to put in, it is not possible to hit upon proportions that will be universally approved. It will therefore be sufficient for me to make choice of such things as the majority are agreed upon, and consequently which are agreeable to the tastes of most. When the chocolate paste is made pretty fine upon a stone, as I have already explained, they add sugar powdered and pass through a fine sears. The true proportion is the same weight of sugar as of kernels, but it is common to put a quarter part less of the former, that it may not dry the paste too much, nor make it too susceptible of impressions from the air, and more subject to be eaten by worms. But this fourth part is again supplied when it is made into a liquor to drink. The sugar being well mixed with the paste, they add a very fine powder made of vanilla and cinnamon, powdered and searced together. They mix all over again upon the stone very well, and then put it in tin moulds, of what form you please, where it grows as hard as before. 
those that love perfumes pour a little essence of amber on it before they put it in the molds when the chocolate is made without vanilla the proportion of cinnamon is two drams to a pound of paste but when vanilla is used it should be less by one half as for the vanilla the proportion is arbitrary one two or three cods and sometimes more to a pound according to every one's fancy those that make chocolate for sale that they may be thought to have put in a good deal of vanilla put in pepper ginger etc there are even some people so accustomed to these tastes that they will not have it otherwise but these spices serving only to inflame the blood and heat the body prudent people take care to avoid this excess and will not use any chocolate whose composition they are ignorant of chocolate made after this manner has this advantage that when a person is obliged to go from home and cannot stay to have it made into drink he may eat an ounce of it and drinking after it leave the stomach to dissolve it in the antilles they make cakes of the kernels only without any addition as i have taught at the end of the first part of this treatise and when they would make chocolate of them they proceed in the following manner the method of making chocolate after the manner of the french islands in america they scrape off with a knife from these cakes aforesaid what quantity they please for instance four large spoonfuls which weigh about an ounce and mix it with two or three pinches of powdered cinnamon finely searced and about two large spoonfuls of sugar in powder they put this mixture into a chocolate pot with a new laid egg both white and yolk then mix all well together with the mill and bring it to the consistence of liquid honey upon which they afterwards pour boiling liquor milk or water as is liked best at the same time using the mill that they may be well incorporated together afterwards they put the chocolate pot on the fire or in a kettle of boiling water and when the chocolate rises they take it off and having well milled it they pour it into the dishes to make the taste more exquisite one may before it is poured out add a spoonful of orange flower water wherein a drop or two of essence of amber has been put this manner of making chocolate has several advantages above any other and which render it preferable to them all in the first place one may assert that being well managed it has a very agreeable smell and a peculiar delicacy in the taste besides it passes very easily off the stomach nor leaves any settling either in the chocolate pot or in the dishes in the second place one has the satisfaction to prepare it oneself to one's own taste to increase or diminish at pleasure the quantities of sugar or cinnamon and to add or leave out the orange flower water or essence of amber and in a word to make any other alteration that shall be most agreeable in the third place they make no additions that destroy the good qualities of the kernels it is so temperate that it may be taken at all times and by all ages in summer as well as in winter without fearing the least inconveniency whereas chocolate seasoned with vanilla and other hot and biting ingredients cannot but be very pernicious especially in summer to young people and to dry constitutions the glass of cold water that they have introduced to drink before it or after it only serves to palliate the effects for a time for the heat that attends it will manifest itself in the blood and viscera when the water is drained off and gone by the ordinary ways in the fourth place a dish is so cheap in the fourth place a dish is so cheap as not to come to above a penny if tradesmen and artisans were once aware of it there are few who would not take the advantage of so easy a method of breakfasting so agreeably at so small a charge and to be well supported till dinner time without taking any other sustenance solid or liquid section two of the uses that may be made of chocolate with relation to medicine i have always imagined it would be a very great advantage to physic if medicines could be administered to sick people under an agreeable form and a familiar taste and the artifice itself of giving anything under the appearance and name of something that is delicate is not without its benefit people afflicted with distempers have enough to do to support their pains 
without the inconveniency of distasteful remedies. However, it would be no small matter to spare them the aversion they have to every thing that is called a medicine, and when there is a necessity for such, chocolate may serve for very proper diet, and an excellent vehicle wherein to take a medicine at the same time. These have been my thoughts for some time, and I can affirm that a happy success has often confirmed my opinion. I could wish that this essay, imperfect as it is, might serve to waken the attention of some ingenious physician who would give himself the trouble to handle this matter with great accuracy than my small penetration will permit me to do. 1. How many people neglect to purge themselves and are so obstinate as to refuse to do it when they have the greatest need of it, and this because of the great distaste they have from ordinary medicines? Will it not be of the greatest service to teach them to purge themselves after a delightful method, and even, if it was necessary, to purge them without their knowledge? To do this you need only mix twenty or twenty-six grains of jalap in powder, more or less according to the age and strength of the person, with so much powder of cinnamon as is common for a dish of chocolate, and to give this dish as if it were ordinary chocolate. I have had great experience of this. It is a good purge without griping. Several have mistaken the effect for the benefit of nature only, being entirely ignorant of the officious deceit which I made use of for their sakes. What advantages may not there be drawn from this method of purging applied to children who are so backward to take anything that has the least ill taste? 2. The preparations of the cortex, both galential and chemical, have not succeeded its infusion in wine, heretofore so much cried up, contains but a part of the virtue, for the feces, or the bark that remains at the bottom of the bottle, has strength enough to cure the intermittent fever. Thus, after a thousand fruitless trials, it is now given again in substance, reduced to a very fine powder, which is either made into boluses, or taken in water. This practice, however, is attended with several inconveniences, for a great many people, especially children, cannot swallow it in boluses. The same inconveniences follow the other way of taking it in water, and is neither less troublesome nor less nauseous. To avoid all this, a dram of the cortex reduced to a fine powder, and finely searced, and afterwards ground dry on a porphyra, with the cinnamon designed for a dish of chocolate, and mixed in the chocolate with more sugar than ordinary may be taken without the least reluctancy, and, if necessary, without being perceived. The person will be nourished at the same time much better than with broth, which is easily corrupted by a feverish stomach. Neither will the particles of the cortex offend the stomach, being wrapped up by the unctuosity of the chocolate. I have cured intermittent fevers after this manner, nor did it ever fail of good success. 3. The most elaborate preparations of steel are not one jot the better upon that account. The simple filings have more virtue than was ever extorted from this metal by any preparation. There is nevertheless an inconveniency in the use of them, because all the particles of the steel uniting together by their weight at the bottom of the stomach form a kind of a cake, which fatigues it and makes it very uneasy. To remedy this, after the filings have been ground into a very fine powder upon a porphyr, you must mix it with the cinnamon, and when you make your chocolate, and it is certain that the particles of the steel will be so divided and separated by the agitation of the mill, and so entangled in the chocolate, that there will be no danger of a future separation. Besides, the aromatic particles of the cinnamon and the alkaline ones of the chocolate will not a little add to the strength and operation of this remedy. 4. After this manner you, may you mix with the chocolate the powders of millipedes, vipers, earthworms, the livers and galls of eels, to take away the distasteful ideas that the sick entertain against these remedies. 5. The use of milk is a specific remedy for the cure of several distempers, but by misfortune there are but few stomachs that can bear it, and several methods have been tried to find out help for this inconvenience without troubling myself to mention or examine them, will it not be an easy and natural method to hinder the milk from curdling on the stomach, to pour a hot dish of chocolate upon a pint or quart of milk? 
the buterous parts of the milk and chocolate are in reality analogous to each other and very proper to be united for the same purpose and what is bitter and alkaline in the chocolate ought necessarily to hinder the curdling of the milk in the stomach it is easy to confirm by experience the reasoning upon this sort of chocolated milk end of section eight Section 9 of The Natural History of Chocolate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Bosk. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. de Quilus. The Third Part, Chapter 3 of The Oil or Butter of Chocolate. Chocolate kernels are a fruit very oleaginous, but the oil is very closely united with the other principles, that it requires a great deal of labor to separate it, and to make it pure. The three common ways to extract oils are by distillation, expression, and decoction. We reject the first as being very imperfect, because the violence of the fire alters the nature of all oils that are extracted that way. The success will answer no better by expression, because that which is got will be very impure and in very small quantity. Then there remains no way but by decoction to draw out this essential oil that we are in quest of, which is the true and the only way, for it gives it in its utmost purity without any alteration. They take chocolate that is roasted, cleaned, and ground upon the stone, they throw the paste into a pan of boiling water over a clear fire. They let it boil till almost all the water is consumed. Then they pour more water upon it till the pan is full. The oil ascends to the top in proportion as the water cools, and grows to the consistence of butter. If this oil is not very white, it needs only be melted in a pan full of hot water where it will be disengaged and purified from the red and terrestrial particles that remain. At Martinico, this oil is of the consistence of butter, but brought into France, it becomes almost as hard as fromage or French cheese, which melts nevertheless, and becomes liquid with a moderate heat. It has no very sensible smell, and has the good fortune never to grow rank. I have some of it now by me, that has been made this fifteen years. One year, when oil of olives failed us, we used that of chocolate during the time of Lent. It is very well tasted, and very far from being hurtful. It contains the most essential and most healthful parts of the chocolate. I had the curiosity to examine it by a chemical analysis. I put three ounces into a little glass cucurbit placed in the heat of ashes. There dropped from it an oily liquor, which congealed as it fell down, and which did not differ from the butter that I have described, but by a light impression made upon it by the fire. I only observed that there was at the bottom of the receiver two or three drops of a clear liquor, which tasted a little acid, but very agreeable. As this oil is very anodyne, or an eraser of pain, it is excellent, taken inwardly, to cure hoarseness, and to blunt the sharpness of the salts that irritate the lungs. In using, it must be melted and mixed with a sufficient quantity of sugar candy, and made into lozenges, which must be held in the mouth as long as may be, before they melt quite away, swallowing it down gently. Oil of chocolate, also taken seasonably, may be a wonderful antidote against corrosive poisons. Its virtues are no ways inferior, if used outwardly, 1. It is the best and most natural pomatum for ladies to clear and plump the skin when it is dry, rough, or shriveled, without making it appear either fat or shining. The Spanish women at Mexico use it very much, and it is highly esteemed by them. If it is thought too hard, it may be softened with oil of ben, or oil of sweet almonds, cold drawn. 2. I am persuaded, if the ancient custom of the Greeks and Romans, of anointing their bodies with oil, was revived, there is nothing would answer their expectations better, in augmenting the strength and suppleness of their muscles, 
and preserving them from rheumatisms and other torturing pains. The leaving of this practice can be attributed to nothing else but to the ill smell and other properties that attended it. But if oil of chocolate was used instead of oil of olives, those inconveniences would be avoided, because it has no smell, and dries entirely into the skin. Nothing, certainly, would be more advantageous, especially for aged persons, than to renew this custom, which has been authorized by the experience of antiquity. 3. Apothecaries ought to make use of this, preferably to all others, as the basis of their apoplectic balsams, because all other oils grow rancid, and the oil of nutmegs, though whitened with spirit of wine, always retains somewhat of its natural smell, whereas oil of chocolate is not subject to any of these accidents. 4. There is nothing so proper as this to keep arms from rusting, because it contains less water than any other oil made use of for that purpose. 5. In the American islands they make use of this oil to cure the piles. Some use it without mixture. Others melt two or three pounds of lead, and gathering the dross, reduce it into fine powder, and after it is finely searced, incorporate it with this oil, and make a liniment of it very efficacious for this disease. Others, for the same intention, mix with this oil the powder of millipedes, sugar of lead, pomphilix, and a little laudanum. Others use this oil to ease gout pains, applying it hot to the part, with a compress dipped in it, which they cover with a hot napkin. It may be used after the same manner for the rheumatism. 6. Lastly, this oil enters the composition of the wonderful plaster, and the pomantum against tetters. You will find their description and properties among the remarks at the end of this treatise. End of section 9. Section 10 of the Natural History of Chocolate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Bosk. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. De Quilus. Remarks upon some places of the treatise upon chocolate. Remark 1. The cocoa tree is the same as the palm tree so famous in the East Indies. Its fruit is called cocoa, and care should be taken that it not be confounded with cacao. I make this remark because I find that William Dampier very improperly calls cocoa's cacao nuts, and the tree that bears them a cacao. Remark 2. They have transported these great trees from St. Domingo to the Vent Islands, their leaves being almost round are firm and so smooth that one would think they had been varnished. Their fruit are sometimes as large as one's head, and their skins very thick. When that is taken off, the pulp is very near the color, smell, and taste of our apricots. In the middle, there are four stones as big as pullet's eggs, which are difficult to separate from the fruit. They are eaten with wine and sugar. They make also very good marmalade. Remark 3. The calabash tree is nigh as large as the apple tree. It supplies the natives and negroes with buckets, pots, bottles, dishes, plates, and several other household utensils. One cannot describe the shape nor bigness of the calabashes, since there are some of the size of a pear, and others as large as the greatest citrons, and besides, they are long, round, oval, and of all fashions. The fruit, which is green and smooth upon the tree, becomes gray as it dries. Within, it is full of a white pulp, of no use at all, which they take out through a hole. The shells they put to several surfaces. The bark is about one-fifth of an inch thick, but very hard and difficult to break. Remark 4. The papa tree is pretty uncommon as to its make. Its trunk is straight, but hollow and of so tender a wood that it is easily cut down with a hedging bill. It is about four yards high, without any branches, its leaves much like those of our fig trees, but twice as big, and are joined to the top by stalks of a foot and a half long, and hollow like a reed. They being about thirty in number, 
grow at the top of the trunk all round about it. The lowest are ripest and largest. They are green, and of the bigness of one's fist. The pulp, which is but half an inch thick, is like that of a melon, but of a sweet, faintish taste. But it makes a pretty good confection, of a fine green color. There is another kind of papaw tree, whose fruit is as large as a melon, and better tasted than the former. Remark 5. The banana is a sort of plant, whose root is a great round bulb, from whence proceeds a trunk, green and smooth, six feet high, as thick as one's thigh, and without any leaf. On the top of it grow about twenty leaves, about a foot and a half broad, and about five feet long, but so tender that the wind tears them from the middle to the sides, into slangs like ribbons. From the center of these leaves grows a second trunk, more firm than the rest of the plant. Upon this grows a cluster of about forty or fifty bananas, sometimes more, sometimes less. A banana is a fruit as thick as one's arm, about a foot long and a little crooked. They gather this cluster green and hang it up in the ceiling, and as the bananas grow yellow or mellow, they gather them. When this cluster is taken away, the plant withers, or they cut it down at the root, but for one trunk lost, the root sends forth five or six more. Besides these bananas, there is a fruit called banana figs, but the plants that produce them are very little different. The figs are much less than the bananas, being but four or five inches long. The fig is more delicious, but the banana is thought to be more wholesome, and the pulp more solid. They roast them upon a gridiron, or bake them in an oven. They eat them with sugar and the juice of an orange. The banana, done in a stewpan in its own juice, with sugar and a little cinnamon, is excellent. Remark 6. Manioc is a shrub very crooked and full of knots. Its wood is tender and brittle, and the branches are easily broke off into slips. There are several and different colors, some more forward and fruitful than others. Commonly, they are plucked up in a year or thereabouts, and there is found at every one several plump roots, without any sensible fibers, more or less thick, according to the kind and the goodness of the soil. These roots are washed in a good deal of water, to free them from the earth, and after they are scraped with a knife like wild turnips, they grate them, that is to say, they rub them hard with great copper graters, which the French call grages, just as they do quinces to get out the juice. This grated manioc is put in the press in sacks made of coarse hemp or rushes, to get out the superfluous moisture, which is not only unwholesome, but poisonous. This, thus pressed, they take from the sacks, and pass it through a coarse sieve called hibichet. They afterwards bake it two several ways, to make what they call cassave, or meal of manioc. In the first place, when they would make the cassave, they spread the sifted manioc upon a plate of iron over a clear fire, which they, tapping down with the ball of their hands, make a broad cake about half an inch thick, and two feet in diameter, and when it is baked on one side, they turn it on the other, and if they would keep it any time, they dry it in the sun. In the second place, when they would make what they call the meal, they put the manioc, grated, pressed, and sifted, as before, upon a great copper plate four feet in diameter, with a brim five or six inches high, and placed upon a brick furnace. They stir it continually with a wooden spatula, that it may not stick and be baked all alike. This meal resembles bread grossly crumbled, and may be kept a long while in a dry place. The natives do not trouble themselves to make the meal. They only eat cassave, which they bake every day, because, when it is hot, it is more agreeable and palatable. If they leave the expressed juice of manioc to settle, it lets fall a fecula to the bottom, called musash, which they afterwards dry in the sun. It is as white as snow, of which they make very good cakes, called in those parts cracklins. The laundresses use this facula instead of starch to starch their linen. Some inhabitants mix one-third of this with two-thirds of French meal and make bread that is very white and well tasted. Remark 7. At first sight, one would take a Belize tree for a banana. They are so like each other. There is, however, this difference between them. 
that the leaves of the Belize tree are not so tender and apt to be tore. For this reason, they serve the natives for the tablecloths and napkins, as well as the negroes, and some of the planters that live in the woods. Sometimes they serve as umbrellas to shade them from the sun or showers of rain that surprise them. The hunters have great assistance from this plant, for sometimes finding themselves pressed with thirst, in places at some distance from rivers or fountains, they give the trunk of the Belize a slash with a knife, and immediately hold their hat or a cup, which catches a clear, good, and cool water, even in the greatest heat. Remark 8. Pimento, called also Jamaica pepper, has been brought into France, where it grows, as in America, in pyramidal cods of three or four inches long. They are at first green, then yellow, afterwards red, and last of all, black. They pickle them in vinegar, as they do capers and little cucumbers. There are in America several other kinds of pimentos, and especially one that is round, and as red as a cherry. This is the hottest of all. It sets the mouth all on fire, for which reason it is called the mad pimento. The natives eat nothing without pimento. It is their universal seasoning. It serves them instead of salt and all oriental spices. Remark 9. Achote is best known in France under the name Ruku, and is a sort of red which the dyers and painters make use of. It is the favorite color of the savages, which they are very careful of planting in their gardens, that they may paint their bodies every morning, which they call rukuing. Ruku is planted of a kernel much after the same manner as the cacao tree. The shrub that is most like it in Europe is the lilac, or the Arabian bean. Its leaves, of the shape of a heart, are longish, pointed, and placed alternately. Its blossoms grow in bunches at the end of the boughs. They are white, mixed with carnation, like the flowers of the wild rose tree. In the middle there is a tuft of yellow stamina, with red points. When these blossoms fall off, there appears tawny buds beset with fine prickles. These buds grow to be shells, which, when ripe, open on the other side, and discover within two rows of pippins, almost like little peas, covered with vermilion, which sticks to the fingers when touched, and leaves the pippins quite when washed with warm water. The water being settled, they pour it off gently by degrees. They dry the color in the shade that fell to the bottom of the vessel, and this is the true ruku, without any mixture. The physicians in these parts prescribe it to cut and attenuate thick and tough humors, which cause difficulty of breathing, retention of urine, and all sorts of obstructions. Remark 10. Atola is a kind of gruel which they make with meal of maize, which is the same as our Indian corn, or turkey millet. The Mexicans season it with pimento, but the nuns and Spanish ladies, instead of pimento, use sugar, cinnamon, perfumed waters of amber, musk, etc. In these parts they make the same use of atola, as of the best rice in the leavens. Remark 11. One ought to choose the smallest cinnamon, the highest colored, and of the most biting taste, as well as sweet and spicy, because a great part is full of pieces, from whence they have drawn the essence, and has neither any color nor taste, but that of the wood. To help and amend both, there needs only a clove to be ground in the mortar, with an ounce of cinnamon. This spice is best that comes from the East Indies. It has nothing of acrid in it, and contains an oleous volatile, which agrees very well with that of chocolate. Cinnamon also has always kept its place in all the compositions of chocolate. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Natural History of Chocolate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History of Chocolate by D. Dequillus. Medicines in whose composition oil or butter of chocolate is made use of. The Wonderful Plaster for the curing of all sorts of ulsters. Take olive oil a pound, Venetian cirrus, 
in powder half a pound put them in a copper pan or a glazed earthen one upon a clear moderate fire stirring them continually with a wooden spatula till the mixture is become black and almost of the consistence of a plaster which you may know by letting fall two or three drops upon a pewter plate for if they grow cold immediately and do not stick to the fingers when touched it is done enough then must be added of beeswax cut in little bits an ounce and a half oil or butter of chocolate an ounce balsam capivi an ounce and a half when they are all melted and mixed together the pan must be taken off the fire and stirring constantly with the spatula you must add the following ingredients reduced into a fine powder separately and then well mixed together lapis calamaranus heated in the fire and then quenched in lime water and ground upon a porphyry one ounce myrrh in drops aloe sucutrine round birthwort florentine orris of each two drams kemphar a dram when they are all well incorporated together they must cool a little and then be poured upon a marble to be made into rolls after the ordinary manner i have seen such surprising effects from this emplaster that i am almost backward to mention them lest they should seem incredible it cures the most stubborn and inveterate ulcers provided the bone is not carious for in this case lest you should lose your labor you must begin with the bone and then apply the plaster the place must be dressed morning and evening after it is cleaned with lime water and wiped well with a linen cloth the same plaster may serve several times provided it be washed with lime water wiped with a rag and held to the fire a moment before it is applied i exhort charitable people to make this plaster and give it to the poor especially those that live in the country they will draw down a thousand blessings in this life and the lord will recompense them hereafter an excellent pomatum for ringworm telters pimples and other deformities of the skin take flowers of brimstone footnote to wit those that are made in holland if they can be got in footnote saltpeter purified of each half an ounce good white precipitate footnote to know if the precipitate be good you may do thus put a little upon a live coal if it flies away it is good if it stays behind it is nothing but powdered cirrus or some such thing in footnote two drams benzoin or benjamin a dram beat the benjamin and saltpetre a good while in a brass mortar till they are reduced into a very fine powder then mix the flour of brimstone and white precipitate with them and keep this powder for use at martinico when i had occasion to make use of it i incorporated it with butter of chocolate but in france i substituted the best scented jessamine pomatum this smell joined with that of benjamin corrects the smell of the brimstone which some persons abhor i cannot sufficiently recommend this pomatum which always succeeds well and i have often found it beneficial when everything else failed you must not wonder if on the first or sometimes the second day the tetar seems more lively or the complexion more dull it is a sign that the malignity is drawn out and that the seeds of it are destroyed you must therefore take heed of desisting for the skin in a little time will be rendered as even and smooth as you can desire end of section 11 end of the natural history of chocolate by d de Quellis. translated by richard brooks 1700 to 1763